I, I might just kick it off. Um, so you're all very welcome to Mental Health Reform's um, second episode in our new webinar series, Coalition Conversations. Um, my name is Amy Hughes and I am the Community Development Officer for Mental Health Reform in the Midwest. Um, we're joined by a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds. So for those who don't know who Mental Health Reform are, we're the leading national coalition on mental health in Ireland. We have over 75 member organisations and we work alongside our members to use their experience and their collective voice to advocate for improvements in mental health services in Ireland. Um, so we're very excited to be discussing today um, the impact of COVID-19 on the Irish context and we're joined by a great panel of expert speakers. Um, we have Emily Flaherty and Martin O'Dwyer from the Department of Health Mental Health Unit. We have Sinead Reynolds from the HSE Mental Health Operations and Performance Unit and we have Martin Rogan from Mental Health Ireland. Um, so this conversation is very apt at the minute and very timely, I suppose, um, because last week was a big week for mental health in Ireland. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, we had the publication of our new mental health policy, sharing the vision, a mental health policy for everyone. Um, and mental health reform are currently working on doing a full analysis of that policy. Um, and we will be linking in with our members and our advisory groups to get their feedback on that. And we hope to have that out and completed in July. Um, and in the same way, week that we had the new mental health policy, we also saw a programme for government from Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and the Green Party. Um, and in that programme for government, they committed to implementing the new mental health policy. Um, that programme for government is currently out with the party members. Um, and we should know more in the next few weeks about whether that will be passed or not. Um, so yeah, a really kind of important week for mental health and it's great to be having this discussion at this time. Um, we have a really kind of full agenda today, so I won't keep you too much longer. I do just need to do a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, for anyone that joined us last week, there were a couple of queries about whether we could see and hear attendees. So rest assured, we can't see or hear you um, as an attendee because we're using a webinar platform, but you can communicate with us. There is a Q&A box and there is a chat box on the bottom of the screen. Um, and we will hope to have time at the end for Q&A for all speakers. So if you think of anything throughout the webinar, you can just submit it using that box and we'll hope to get to it at the end. Um, if there are any technical issues on the call, if you could call my colleague Ray on 086 171 1920 and I will put that number in the chat as well. So if there's anything at all, you can give him a call and he will try and, try and help you out with that. Um, we would also ask that if you want to talk about the event on social media, and um, if you want to share about it, you can use the hashtag Coalition Conversations, which you should be able to see there on the screen, um, or our Twitter handle MHReform. Um, and finally, there will be a recording made available of this event to all attendees, and it will be on our YouTube channel, so you don't need to remember everything from this. Um, okay, so without further ado, I might hand you over to our first two speakers. So we have Emily Flaherty, who is Administrative Officer in the Department of Health, Mental Health Unit, and we have Martin O'Dwyer, who is Higher Executive Officer in the Department of Health, Mental Health Unit. And Emily, I think you're going to speak first, so I might hand it over to you. Uh, thanks for that, Amy. Uh, so firstly, thank you to Mental Health Reform for inviting Martin and myself to present today. Um, so I'm going to discuss uh, recent Department of Health mental health well-being and online initiatives uh, in relation to the response to COVID-19 and then talk about how these initiatives relate to the direction in which mental health service delivery is going as set out in the new national mental health policy sharing the vision, a mental health policy for everyone, which, as Amy said, and as I'm sure you all know, was launched last week. Um, so Martin will also talk a little bit about the policy and also talk about it in specifically in relation to the Individual Placement and Support Programme, or IPS, and he's also going to talk a bit about the Mental Health Task Force. Um, so uh, to start off, without doubt, this uh, global outbreak of COVID-19 that we've been all living through has caused significant stress, anxiety, worry and fear for many people. Uh, this arises from the disease itself, the worry that you or your family or friends might get it or be carriers of it, as well as from impacts such as increased social isolation, disruption to daily life, and, certain, un, and uncertainty around em, uh, employment and financial security. Um, so to begin with, the uh, Department of Health, um, led by the Healthy Ireland team and the HSE in collaboration with various uh, cross-government and cross-sexual partners, partners has developed a mental well-being campaign. 
uh, this campaign offers support and resources to help deal with the stress, anxiety and isolation currently experienced by many people. Uh, the campaign is hosted on uh, gov.ie forward slash together and appoints people to the HSE is uh, your mental health supports and resources, which include many online and telephone services, which um, I'll get to shortly, as well as providing uh, tips and advice from cross government and Healthy Ireland partners on topics such as physical activity, parenting, coping with daily routines, supporting the cocooned, etc. And uh, the campaign basically combines resources and advice for positive mental health promotion, as well as signposting to um, appropriate and supports. Um, Additionally, uh, the yourmentalhealth.ie website provides a one-stop shop portal for people seeking information, supports and services, including information on accessing urgent help. Um, so then moving on to what's going on in online uh, mental health services. So over the past few years, the past two years, uh, the Department of Health has worked with uh, HSE Mental Health Services to provide online services. Um, online interventions have particularly facilitated remote access to supports during this period and will continue to be available uh, in the post-COVID phase. Um, so the Department of Health has provided uh, 1.1 million to enhance these online supports specifically for mild to moderate mental health issues related to COVID-19 and an additional 1.1 million has been allocated through the Sláinte Care Integration Fund to extend these supports to the end of the year. Um, so during this time, uh, additional online supports can help mental health services to address the numbers anticipated to develop common mental health conditions. as well as provide effective content. Delivering online counselling is a good way to engage individuals um, during this crisis because it offers wider reach of mental health services and access to these, cost efficiencies in delivering high volume services, treatment innovation and enhancement, more user involvement and empowerment. And just more generally, um, traditional service models are evolving alongside the major societal trends over the past few years, um, past number of years associated with the pervasiveness of the internet, smartphones, other technologies. So emerging, emerging communication modes, such as uh, instant chats, such as that uh, offered by Crisis Text Line, which I'll get to in a minute, are increasingly employed to reach and engage with um, demographic groups uh, that favor these. Um, so just kind of on the crisis text line, which was launched early, uh, which was launched nationally uh, last week, that would be an example of one of these more innovative technology based solutions. Um, the project was running a, uh, a pilot in Ireland uh, for the past year, and it has been available in other countries and records successful outcomes. Um, it's Ireland's first 24-7 uh, text service and it provides everything from a calm and chat to uh, support for people going through uh, a mental health or emotional crisis. Um, and it's specifically targeted at the younger population of Ireland, um, providing an opportunity to contact uh, trained volunteers that are who are clinically supported uh, to offer a kind of li listening ear to those in need. Um, another example uh, more recently would be My Mind, another for a funded partner which recently launched additional counselling sessions and is working with Sláinte Care and the HSE to provide counselling, psychotherapy and psychological support for individuals and all um, in response to the mental health challenges posed by COVID-19. Uh, individuals can self-refer and engage in online counselling from their homes. Um, and then obviously additionally at present there's a range of existing supports provided by NGO funded partners which offer online and text and telephone supports to people seeking uh, information, advice and support during this time. So that would include uh, Turn to Me, Pieta House, the Samaritans, you know, I, I could go on. Um, there's an extensive number of NGOs doing kind of great work at the moment and um, the, you, the Your Mental Health IE website is where, you know, um, you could access kind of a comprehensive kind of list of, you know, supports and, uh, and so on. Um, so just coming now to how this relates to the direction mental health services are going in. Um, so the substantial increase in the use of online services possibly points to the way forward in the post-COVID world, where people suffering from mild to moderate mental health issues can access help at their, fi can access help at their fingertips. 
So um, the new national mental health policy sharing the vision was launched last week, and it should be noted that this policy very much reflects this approach. Um, just to briefly introduce sharing the vision, because I believe uh, Martin will also talk about it a bit, and um, I believe a colleague of ours will also be presenting on it in more detail in a few weeks' time. Um, sharing the vision um, envisages a mental health system that addresses the needs of the population through a focus on the requirements of the individual, and it was developed following uh, an extensive process of uh, consultation and research. And it envisages a number of key outcomes, which are promotion, prevention, and early intervention, service access, coordination, and continuity of care, social inclusion, and accountability, and continuous improvement. So just to focus on the first outcome uh, that I mentioned there, promotion, prevention, and early intervention, um, the policy focuses, uh, promises early intervention when problems manifest, together with a focus on prevention and positive mental health promotion. So in this vein, the policy has a lot of recommendations around positive mental health promotion, taking a life cycle approach so that positive mental health is promoted at all ages. Um, so in many ways, the positive mental health promotion that has been very much part of the department's mental health response to COVID is very much the direction the policy is taking us in. And additionally, the policy has a number of recommendations on using online or digital services, um, either for mental health promotion or as part of service delivery. And as we have seen, the advent of COVID has already led to an acceleration in the delivery of online mental health services. Um, so a lot of these developments that I kind of referenced earlier uh, were already in progress uh, prior to this period, but have due to necessity accelerated uh, considerably in response to COVID-19. And I guess the point uh, I'd just like to leave you with is that the steps that have been taken in the kind of well-being and online space uh, as part of the mental health response to COVID-19 are very much the same direction that the new mental health policy sharing the vision is going in. Um, so thank you very much for that. And I'll now pass you on to uh, Martin. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Amy. Um... So, uh, yeah, so another, uh, th thanks, um, Emily, for, for, for that. Um, and a, another aspect of the, 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 the COVID-19 emergency, I suppose, that was sort of unintended was that the, the policy has been ready for um, a, a while now, but actually the, the, the COVID-19 emergency was the, that final fill-up that managed to get it over the line. The intention was that it would be published by a new government, which would have made, made sense, but that's taken time to get in place. So, um, so the, the publication was brought forward. So it was, you know, um, I know that there's a lot of interest in when it was going to be published and, you know, when the there was a lot of talk about um, the, the old policy and, you know, how it was out of date and stuff. So that's one of the sort of unintended consequence of, of COVID-19. Um, as Emily has already mentioned um, about the online and uh, wellbeing initiatives that um, have formed part of the government's response to COVID-19, all of those are well aligned with, uh, the, with the new policy with them um, sharing the vision. And the new uh, policy has a very strong focus on uh, social inclusion and recovery and on the um, continued move towards um, community-based services, which was also a focus within uh, Vision for Change. This emphasis came through um, from the over oversight group members themselves and from the extensive consultation process um, during the development of the policy. Um, now, in parallel with um, the policy development, um, over the last number of years, there's been complementary work ongoing in developing novel community-based recovery-focused services. Um, and this work has obviously been affected by the COVID um, response over the last couple of months, but is still in a high state of readiness to be incorporated into any policy response that going forward. Um, just some background on that work. It was um, funded through um, the Service Reform Fund. Um, so uh, the HSE, or sorry, the, the Department of Health, basically provided matching funding to the service reform fund, which is um, the money from the, the, the funds in that are provided by Atlantic Philanthropies. Um, and the, the, the fund is administered by Genio. And then the work on, that I'm going to describe has actually been implemented by um, the Mental Health Engagement and Recovery Office within the HSE and in collaboration with Genio. And it dovetails very well with um, sharing, sharing the vision, the new policy. And the, the three areas that I'll, I'll talk about are um, advancing recovery, the individual placement and support uh, scheme and community living. So advancing recovery is a program which aims to support HSE staff and service users working together to make community mental health services more recovery focused. Um, 
The recovery principles are based on the CHIME framework, which many of you will be familiar with. And uh, the programme is designed to develop systems that enable all stakeholders, including service users, to be involved in the improvement of services. Um, each CHO, so all the nine CHOs, have a recovery plan in place. And a key objective within that is to make recovery education accessible to everyone. Um, and a large number of staff have received training in, um, in these recovery principles. Um, so um, all CHOs and the National Forensic Mental Health Service, I should say, have made uh, available uh, training, and made training available to all staff. And as far as I'm aware, about 60% of the last um, check was at the last um, um, survey, 60% of community mental health teams had attended training workshops of some description um, in this area. So um, the work in this program is facilitated by recovery coordinator and educator staff and by national peer worker staff at the various sites. And some of that work has been adversely affected by the recent COVID-19 um, issues. Um, the individual placement and support scheme is uh, an evidence-based uh, approach to supporting employment for people who have severe mental health difficulties and who are availing, availing of and registered with mental health services. So it's only for people who are actually registered with um, uh, the service, uh, HSC services at the moment, although that could be expanded back in principle. Um, the, the scheme works by having employment coaches embedded in the community mental health um, teams um, and all the CHOs have got uh, these employment specialists now as integrated into their, into their um, CMH teams. Um, and the National Forensic Mental uh, Health Service also has an employment specialist. Um, I think it's part-time though, I think it's a, a 0.5 WTE. Um, the principal objective of IPS is to support people in their efforts to achieve steady employment in mainstream competitive jobs. Um, this employment can be either part-time or full-time as preferred by the client. This is the obvious benefits to social inclusion and in personal recovery. Um, at, at the moment, there are about 25 um, employment specialists um, in the um, community mental health teams, in all nine CHOs and in the um, forensic service as well. And that varies from time to time in that some people, so occasionally there are staff that leave and staff that are joining and being trained up and I know that there are also employment specialists that are funded through other um, routes as well other than the, the, the social reform fund. Now obviously the social reform fund comes to an end shortly so it'll be up to the, the department then and the HSE to continue, to continue on those, those programs. Um, community living is a program designed to help people into independent living in the community. Um, all the CHOs have a funded housing coordinator in place and National Mental Health Service was recruiting a coordinator as well. They may well have already done that. Um, I'm not aware of the current situation, um, but that was their intention. And in the, in the past year, 30 people have been supported into uh, to trans to, um, transitioning to independent living. So it's been quite effective actually as, a, as an approach to helping people to move away from um, shelters, wherever they're, situation was an inter independent community um, situation. Housing coordinators are embedded within the CHOs and each CHO has a developed strategic objective locally and there's also national um, strategic objectives as well. Um, network networking and relationship building um, takes place across all government and community level stakeholder groups and this unfortunately has been affected by um, COVID recently. However, hopefully moving forward, that will be that'll come to an end at some point, or at least will be dealt with in some other satisfactory way. Um, national housing coordinator meetings take place on a regular basis as a way of sharing information and also to provide learning opportunities for those staff. So development, staff development meetings, essentially. Um, housing coordinators also attend a broad range of CHO level network and advisory group meetings with key stakeholders, which would include local authorities and other um, HSE departments. Um, all the above programs have obviously been affected by uh, COVID-19 and the emergency measures that have been in place for the, the last while. Um, this, is incur this has occurred for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, there's been a restriction on actual meetings face-to-face -face, and where possible, um, 
uh, remote access as um, like activity has continued, uh, continued remotely using the likes of Zoom or, or whatever um, Teams is another one of these um, applications that can be used. But it's not always possible to do that, and not not everyone has um, has that facility to do that as well. It's also been the case that for the purposes of the um, the COVID emergency or the COVID uh, response, um, some staff have been reassigned temporarily to other duties. And I know that particularly in IPS that the the staff there and the employment specialists have all been have been reassigned. In fact, actually, the, the main coordinator of that that particular program has also been reassigned uh, temporarily. Now, um, obviously, as time goes moves on, um, we'll come to the end of this particular um, issue, and all those programs will be able to be reinstated again. And that should coincide with um, now that the pub, now the policy has been published. Um, there is the intention as outlined in the policy, is to um, set up a national implementation monitoring group and um, to oversee the implementation of the policy. And obviously those programmes can feed in directly to its body of work as it sees fit. Um, now, the, 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 the membership of that committee, which I won't... It's, it's, there's an indicative um, description of what the membership of that group will be. There's been a lot of interest in that group. Um, obviously, a new minister will have uh, an effect on, on the final composition. Of the group and, and the nature of the work that the, the, the work program as they see the what priorities they see fit to be uh, implemented um, initially and going forward although it is described in the policy um, we have set out time frames in which certain objectives will be met and what have you um, however with uh, the policy was developed in a time prior to um, COVID-19 so it might be that that COVID-19 will be at the front of everybody's mind. So that might have some temporary initial effect, but um, obviously the policy is a 10-year policy. So um, hopefully it will outlast COVID-19 and we can get back to normal at some stage in the future. So um, I think that's probably all I need to, to say on that. If that's okay, Amy. Great, thanks Martin and thanks Emily as well. Um, I see a good few questions coming in there guys, but if it's okay with everyone, we'll just keep them to the end and try to get through as many as possible. We'll get through the speakers first. Um, that was really interesting. Thanks Emily and Martin for giving us an overview of the department's response in terms of mental health and COVID and then also drawing parallels between that and our new policy and some other initiatives that were already in place. Um, Great. Okay, so I might just hand over to our next speaker. So we have Dr. Sinead Reynolds, who is General Manager in HSE Mental Health Operations and Performance Unit. Um, so Sinead, you might just try share your screen there. Yeah. Um, oh, okay, just one second. Share screen. <sighs> Sorry, it was here a minute ago. I need to open it again. Great. That, that's the wrong, the wrong slide. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, do you want me to take it from here? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about mental health services and our delivery of services during COVID. Um, I suppose to say at the beginning, we, in, in, in our delivery of mental health services in, in the HSC, we are always challenged in terms of funding and in terms of our attempts to provide the best possible services within the resources available. Um, and the COVID context has most increased those challenges quite significantly. I know that our workforce have um, been very motivated to do the very best they can in these very challenging times in order to continue to provide services as well as they possibly could but there is no doubt that COVID has had an effect on the quality of mental health service provision in the last number of months um, and people have worked very hard in order to provide the best quality service they, they could but we would acknowledge that, that, that there are challenges and difficulties and problems with access etc. 
So I suppose just to say how we approached this was that during the pandemic, we looked at what services needed to be suspended, what services could we could continue to deliver, but in a reduced way. And then we have some services that we absolutely needed to con continue to deliver with very little disruption. Um, and so we would have divided our services into those kind of um, groupings. Um, Obviously, any services we deliver, we, we feel are essential. We wouldn't be delivering them if we didn't think they were essential. So decisions about what to suspend and what to reduce were very difficult because we actually don't want to suspend or reduce anything. However, the, the, the position in which we found ourselves with the pandemic meant that we did have to do that. But we do deliver some essential services that absolutely couldn't be reduced in any way. Um, so I, I decided today because of the other speakers that I would try and focus more on the um, specialist mental health services because there's a lot to say about um, lower levels in that pyramid or that hierarchy of needs to do with health and well-being and, and you know mental health at primary care level but I wanted to focus on some of the specialist mental health services because I suppose that's the piece that maybe I can bring that won't be um, quite so much in, in at the forefront of other people other people's um, job specs really. So the first the first one is I started at the very top in terms of the acuity level so I just want to fly down through the mental health services that we currently deliver and how they were affected by COVID. So the forensic mental health services continued to be delivered during COVID. However, I suppose as with all of our services, we were challenged in terms of staffing um, because we would have had staff who had to isolate, who were sick, um, etc. And so delivering services when you're very challenged by staffing issues is, is difficult. But for the most part, the forensic mental health services continued because we have service users in those services who remained in the services throughout. And so there was an essential need to provide services. Um, at the next level, we have our acute admission units, and that was very similar. We were challenged by staffing and we were challenged by, I suppose, infrastructure and buildings and the need to keep people um, separate from each other and to um, have social distancing and indeed isolation at times. But for the most part, the acute admission units were up and running and open for business during uh, COVID-19. And the same with the approved centres. And the reason I've separated them is because our acute admission centres are places that people, centres kind of, they cross. So we have some acute admission units that are, that are approved centres, but we also have some service users in some of our approved centres who are there for quite a long period of time. So we would have service users who stay kind of months to sometimes years in some of our approved centres and um, whereas the acute admission units would be people who have shorter stays generally and I suppose what was interesting was we were getting um, HPSC guidance on residential units and acute units and our difficulty in mental health was that some of our units fell kind of in the middle of both of those so we would have had units where they were both acute and long stay and so we had to work through the guidance and make sure that we were providing the the, the safest service possible for our service users at this time. The next level down is our community residences and we have quite a few of those and they're sometimes called hostels but they are places where people live in the community and we would have had to follow um, the HPSC guidance in terms of long-term residential units in those in those centres and um, so things like mass staff testing was done and um, we would have been very aware of um, clients and emerging symptomatology and the need to keep an eye out for that and to set to isolate people and separate people and cohort people if those issues arose and we also sometimes needed to decant people from some of those centres so you know we had people who we're living in centres where really we just couldn't socially distance them to the degree that we needed to or that they would have wanted. So sometimes people moved to other places in order to provide a little bit more room. Um, and that was done in consultation with service users. Um, the next thing that happens routinely in mental health services is that we have mental health commission inspections and again that was something that was paused because again we had difficulties in terms of we couldn't have people coming in and out of units on um, 
but we had to keep that to the very minimum. So the inspections were paused. However, the Mental Health Commission were doing a weekly um, review of units by phone and they were providing information to, to the department on a weekly basis in terms of the current status for COVID and for staffing and PPE and that sort of thing. So they've been doing that on a weekly basis and they are due in the next couple of months to get those inspections back up and running. They will be um, changed to some degree in that they're going to be one day inspections now and we're going to try and minimise footfall but we are getting the inspections back up and running over the next couple of months. The next uh, issue is mental health tribunals and again that's something that is part of our routine practice within mental health services for people who are involuntarily detained and we're very conscious of the rights of people who are involuntary, um, involuntarily detained and for the, uh, the need for oversight by more than one person so there's a, a need in terms of the rights perspective to make sure that when we do involuntarily detain people that we are ensuring that their rights are met. So there are tribunals where there are independent clinical opinions and there are um, legal representatives, etc. So those tribunals, uh, on a, as a matter of course, take place in the inpatient units, but that was a, another thing that we needed to suspend during COVID in order to ensure health and safety for service users and also for staff. So the law was changed at the beginning when COVID um, came upon us in March in order to allow us to do those those tribunals um, remotely and that is what's been happening for the last couple of months and um, that is something that we now need to review we need to talk to service users and staff who've been involved in that to find out what that experience was like for them in order to inform our kind of knowledge as time uh, going forward because we need to be aware of what that was like if there's a second wave and indeed were there advantages and disadvantages to it and um, the next area is day services and um, unfortunately our day services were hit quite quite significantly by covid and um, because the day services involve people in congregated settings and that was something that needed to be kept to a minimum so our day services were affected by covid sorry um, the next thing is community mental health teams and I suppose our inpatient units were very clear that they really wanted to make sure that the community mental health teams were protected as much as possible and were able to do their work still because if you take away all the lower levels of support what happens is people's um, acuity increases so in order to make sure that people didn't um, deteriorate in terms of their mental health, it's important that you have all of the community um, interventions in place and that fits with Slauncher Care, it fits with the new vision, etc. So the community mental health teams were up and running during COVID and um, there was a number of appointments were done by phone or by other remote means, but there was still some face-to-face -face, um, assessments and interventions happening. And I suppose there were for variation around the country in terms of areas that were hit more significantly by COVID and areas that weren't but certainly there were the community mental health teams were still seeing people throughout but at a, a much reduced level and um, the same can be said for family and carer support some of that was paused and um, others was moved to online and phone support and um, Peer support groups were similar mental health engagement continued to work throughout but um, again you know, that was moved to um, to be done remotely as much as possible. And I'm kind of mo moving down through, through the hierarchy now. So I've got to primary care services and they're not specialist mental health services. So services like counselling and primary care and primary care psychology services. Um, um, counselling and primary care did continue, but they again moved to phone with some face-to-face -face appointments um, and psychology and primary care were asked to lead out on some of the psychosocial responses to COVID and also a number of primary care staff were redeployed to other things that needed to happen during COVID. So both of those would have had an effect on the availability of primary care psychology services. Um, again, the National Counselling Service is very similar to SIPSI. And then we, our partner organisations would have continued to work throughout. And again, there was a lot of our partner organisations moved to doing more remote and telephone and digital type work. And I know that mental health operations have had weekly calls with our partner organisations. Um, I think they've recently moved to fortnightly, but that was an, um, an attempt to make sure that we're all on one page and that everybody's moving in the same direction and that if there are things that our partner 
organisations needed to bring to our attention that they had a forum in which to do that. And I suppose one of the issues that did come up quite regularly was issues around funding, because a lot of our partner organisations were um, stymied in terms of their fundraising efforts that would have been ongoing, but that couldn't, couldn't kind of continue in the normal way because of COVID. Um, I suppose just to say that at the moment there is a big focus in the HSE on return to health services post-COVID. As I said, in mental health specialist services particularly, um, it's not really a return in that there was always a, a significant level of work going on, but there is um, a consideration of how we get all health services back up and running. And so we're, we're looking at things like the considerations that we need to take into account there for all health services, including mental health, and they are things like like environmental adaptation, so looking at the health and safety authorities' guidance, looking at um, infection prevention and control requirements, um, process adaptation, so looking at things like appointment scheduling and limiting waiting areas. So um, I suppose that has, for our outpatient clinics, for example, there, there has been a tradition of people waiting for outpatient appointments in crowded waiting rooms. That's not something that can happen anymore. And um, in a way, COVID perhaps has pushed us to do things that we should have done anyway and um, so so the next one is flexible hours and suitability for extended hours and I know that that's something that comes up quite a lot and um, in terms of maybe it's something that we should have been doing anyway but certainly COVID has pushed us to look at that again and um, the enablers are things like IPC guidance so there is national guidance that we have to follow in terms of infection prevention and control there's national guidance in terms of PPE um, and infrastructure adaptations but the infrastructure adaptations bring its own challenges in terms of funding because it, it costs money to make to make amendments to our, our I suppose our physical infrastructure. Um, also the enablers are things like new and blended approaches to health service delivery. So all of the work that we had been doing in mental health around telehealth has kind of stood to us during these challenging times. Um, and certainly telehealth was an agenda that we had in mental health anyway. But we're also aware that telehealth solutions are not the answer for everyone and there is um, there are groups that we serve within mental health who um, need more than telehealth or who might have access issues in terms of telehealth or for whom that just that isn't a mode that suits them so we need to be aware of that and that's why we've said blended approaches because it won't be it won't be one or the other it'll be both depending on the needs of service users and um, the next one is effective pathways of care so that has to do with optimizing patient flow so i suppose what we know from from the nursing homes is that it's important that we try and keep people home as much as possible and the same in mental health it's important that we try to move away from congregated settings as much as we can and you really concentrate our efforts on keeping people at home and then the dependencies are put things like public health advice and guidance which is ongoing and changes and we need to keep pace with that workforce capability so things like training and development and ways of working and training and development i suppose is something that's been quite challenging for us because traditionally we would have done a lot of our training and development development in rooms with people in the same room and um, so in our inpatient unit staff training is an ongoing feature but that ability to do training now in a COVID environment has been a uh, challenge to some extent. Um, estates and infrastructure adaptations need to be done and again that's finance dependent and um, management information systems usage so our ability to get to get all of the data that we need in order to ensure that all of our adaptations are based on evidence and our data informed is a challenge and then obviously finance and budgets are, are a significant challenge for us as well. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention, and I think Philip Dodd is coming to one of these in a few weeks' time to talk in more detail about the HSE psychosocial plan in response to COVID. Um, we have put together a, a, a group who's looking at the psychosocial response to COVID in the HSE. Um, and that group, the psychosocial response group to COVID, is looking at harnessing international evidence about best practice um, in the COVID context. It's also planning to develop a 
framework for psychosocial structures and responses for the public with a focus on priority groups and healthcare workers. Um, so we have a number of priority groups and groups that maybe um, might find it more difficult to access the sorts of services that will be developed in response to COVID. So we need to take that into account. And we also need to take into account the needs of our healthcare workers across the sector. So we're not just talking about HSC staff because these have been challenging times for healthcare workers and we need to ensure that we're supporting them appropriately. And then the last one is to align and integrate services so that support is available to those who need it. Um, so a lot of people have asked us what we mean by social, psychosocial and to some extent it's a term that we in the business may be quite familiar with but for um, you know members of the public psychosocial may not be a term with which they're familiar so when we, when we use it we're referring to overall well-being resilience and the mental health of our population and so it's, it's, a, it's a broad term that covers kind of the whole spectrum of supports that are necessary. Um, and the, the spectrum of supports is shown in the psychosocial layered care framework. And many of you will see, have seen this layered care framework in terms of stepped care to um, approaches to, to mental health service delivery, but also to health and well-being and mental health promotion, et cetera, et cetera. So our psychosocial group is going to look at this from a layered care framework where we're looking at things like social, societal well-being, resilience and safety. And then we're looking at people's need for self-help, which will be a smaller group. So we want to focus very much on the whole population and um, supporting people to, to remain resilient with some supports around self-help and then some people-to-people -people support and then primary care and voluntary care services, moving into specialist mental health services and then supports for people with severe and enduring needs. And I suppose one of the main messages of the psychosocial group is that COVID does not mean that, uh, you know, a, a lot of people are going to present with mental health difficulties. There's many different layers of support that can be given and the aim is to support people to to stay at a lower level of acuity and avoid people moving up through this triangle to the top of it. Um, there are a number of existing psychosocial supports at the moment um, and a number of people on the phone will be on this call will be very familiar with a lot of these and um, so we have dedicated supports for health service staff at the moment we have dedicated support information on hse.ie which I know was mentioned earlier we have self-directive innovative online support programs at the moment through things like silver cloud and then we have our ongoing access to therapy and to the more specialist mental health services um, that's just the project structure for the psychosocial project. I am, I'm not going to say too much about it because I'm under pressure for time, but I would say that there are, there's a psychosocial steering group and there are work streams. So one of the work streams is looking at the public psychosocial response. Another one is looking at staff psychosocial response. And then we have a third work stream that's looking at technical support, research measures and stakeholder engagement. And then the final group is the expert advisory group where we have a number of members from various different different um, agencies who are helping to make sure that we're on track. Um, that group has developed a bereavement guidance because that was one of the needs that was um, made clear very early on in this process that we needed particular health sector national psychosocial um, response in terms of a bereavement guidance. So that has been developed and shared. Um, and then there is another um, initiative recently is Silver Cloud Health. And I think that uh, communication went out to all the NGOs recently around this. So Silver Cloud have made available um, a number of different packages in terms of support. Um, one is, and it's based on CPT approaches. So one is space from COVID, one is uh, supports in terms of stress, another one is based on resilience, and then the final was one is on sleep. And these um, supports are available to the whole of the health sector so people working in NGOs will have um, will be able to access those as well um, and what we found is that we've had 2,419 2, users have signed up in recent months um, and there have been high rates of satisfaction with the programme and um, for example 97% of respondents strongly agreed that this module was relevant to them so that's something that's available for the to the wider sector. Um, what's next? 
I suppose a couple of things in terms of the psychosocial response, we're currently mapping supports that are available within the CHOs and nationally. So we're doing a mapping of services that are available. And again, that's something that would have gone out to all of the NGOs. I think it went out last week. And we are using the information we get from that and also the current evidence base to um to, to develop a psychosocial framework document which we're hoping will be published by the end of July and that will provide guidance for the whole health sector in terms of our psychosocial response to COVID. Um, so how are we going to get there? I suppose for all of us together we're going to need to work together with you as our partners um, and with our internal stakeholders and our, our stakeholders within the department etc and obviously also with service users and families with our partner organizations with other state agencies for example housing and then with other care groups for us we have a dependency on care groups like primary care and health and well-being and so I think that the new policy being called sharing the vision is very um, relevant because given that we're going to have significant re resource uh, constraints over the next few years, it's really important that we are working together to make sure that there is very little duplication in our system and that we are bringing things together so that we together are providing the very best services that we can. Um, and so we work through the enablers and the dependencies to achieve that shared vision and provide the highest quality services possible within the resources available. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thanks um, Sinead for that. And thanks for giving such a comprehensive overview of how the different levels of mental health services have been impacted by COVID and what the plan is going forward. Um, I see lots of questions coming in guys and we are a little tight on time. So um, we will try our best to get to them at the end and we are reading them all. Um, but without further ado, I might hand you over to Martin Rogan, who is CEO of Mental Health Ireland. Hey, thanks, Amy, and thanks to the team at um, Mental Health Forum for the invitation to participate. And I suppose at the start, just to congratulate our colleagues at the Department of Health on the launch last week of um, Sharing the Vision, which I think is a really comprehensive piece and a major step forward uh, in relation to Vision for Change as well. So I suppose let's look at the landscape in terms of it. I suppose when we're talking about the voluntary sector or the NGO sector, the not for profit sector in mental health. This is a very broad range of groups, some who are operating nationally in terms of funded agencies, household names like Aware, Grow and Shine, Mental Health Ireland, uh, My Mind, Suicide or Survive, Irish Advocacy Network, Bodywise, Jigsaw, uh, Mental Health Reform. So it's a, it's a broad group, but we also know that there's over a thousand smaller agencies operating in the NGO sector in mental health right across the country, sometimes at a very local level or working in a very specific way. And I suppose the NGO sector not unique to mental health, is an interesting space. I suppose sometimes people think of the, the NGO sector as providing a, an enhanced service or an addition or some sort of a upstream or downstream component of core services. Whereas, in fact, when you actually examine the landscape, you see that they're, they're integral to, to many parts of core service provision. And, and NGOs and, and agencies are working right across the spectrum from promoting positive mental health, working with colleagues in primary care, working with adults and children and older persons, everything from information and awareness, uh, self-help and support, very direct uh, peer-led services, and also in terms of other provision of counselling and therapies, working with marginalised groups, hard to reach groups as well, and providing a whole range of different therapies and counselling, either in, in person or increasingly, as we've seen over the last number of weeks, virtually and, and digitally. Um, and providing helplines and we've seen something about migration over the last number of weeks in terms of services that were providing helplines found themselves moving up the food chain in terms of the urgency of people's need so what was an information line became a helpline and what was a helpline became a crisis line and it, certainly the feedback from volunteers and staff and many a number of agencies has been that the intensity and the urgency of these calls has, has been deeper uh, the duration of calls has been deeper and also the ref forward referral pathways have often been quite complex with agencies you'd naturally guide an individual towards in terms of dynamic signposting. Sometimes the, these services were interrupted, had been closed or weren't available. So we've seen a migration and movement. So things were operating outside of their original design and that required a degree of adaptation and additional training and extra capacity coming into place as well. So that's been a really important piece. I suppose the, the NGO sector 
and it is, it's a broad church, even in terms of if you look at who are we talking about. So we're often talking about volunteers who are drawn from a whole range of different community leads. So people with lived experience, people in recovery, family members, local community leaders, um, people who work in other sectors, be that in culture, art and civic. Um, but you're also talking about uh, paid staff members who support volunteers or are directly providing services. And that's right across the spectrum. So a whole range of different activities there. But as I said, these services are often integral to, to community service and uh, to supporting individuals in, in their own recovery and supporting whole communities as well. So the question is, are they icing or are they cake? And sometimes they're both the icing and the cake. So they're not just designed to be additional enhancements or decorative. Sometimes they are actually core and uh, as a, an essential component of service. They operate in an interesting space. If you look at the NGO sector across all domains in Ireland, you're talking about a sector of about between about 14 billion euro worth of activity. And about half of that funding is self-generated through a whole variety of different events, sometimes very small, low-key events within localities. And there's been huge public support there. But oftentimes these have been interrupted. Events like you know, um, church gate collections, smaller raffles, smaller events, quiz nights, etc. And they simply had to stop and couldn't go forward. Or even much larger events like uh, Darkness into Light, organised by Piesha. Simply it wasn't possible to do that. Um, in the context of public health advice. So these are major disruptors um, and had a huge impact economically right across the sector as well. We're also really appreciative to and recognise that many of the agencies I've described there, and these are the national funded agencies, and there's many other agencies that are funded at a local level, but the, we work very close with HSE and Sinead has described, we have fortnightly Friday morning calls. Each agency has an opportunity to update, we collaborate, we get feedback in terms of what's happening. On the Thursday, there's a linkage with NASP, National Office of Suicide Prevention for agencies working in self-harm and suicide and for the wider mental health community on a Friday morning. And these have been really very useful. And what's been very helpful to our sector as well is there's a, a complete recognition and a great transparency about saying many of the elements of our service arrangement commitments simply cannot be delivered as originally anticipated or envisioned. Um, and HSE is, has underwritten to commit to the, the existing service arrangements while we make adaptations, while we change, while we migrate to new digital platforms or other formats. And that's, that's really been very, very helpful. In a number of the agencies that are much more dependent on self-funding and self-generated funds, either through earned income, through training, etc., Some have had to depend on uh, wage subsidy schemes. Some have had to furlough staff uh, and have had to abandon and abort you know, major parts of the program this year. And that does have a very real impact. So certainly we're hearing that feedback from individuals using services and family members. In terms of COVID, which I suppose it was interesting, I was watching um, some recorded TV and if you watch the adverts from programs that are recorded back in March, you could feel this building anticipatory anxiety, this tsunami was coming towards us. And it was very unsettling, very, very frightening, and not just for vulnerable people, but for anyone who was clued in and aware and taking note of what was happening. This was going to be a major shift the natural passions, the natural things that keep us all uh, in good health and enjoying good mental health and staying connected with our neighbourhoods and communities, be that sport or culture or other activities and friendships, these were disrupted and torn and there were certain hazards associated with cocooning, particularly for older persons. And in the NGO sector, if we look at the age profile of people who volunteer, we often found that there was a significant capacity loss as older volunteers who man helplines, who operate charity shops and have a range of other programmes, and bring a great wisdom and life experience to the mental health space um, had to retract in terms of their own uh, personal health and safety. So there was a, a significant capacity shrink there that we had to be very aware of as well. But certainly in terms of the, the, the shape of the demand, it was quite different. It was a, a new urgency and there was a new audience for people coming forward recognizing mental health need in themselves and in their families. And oftentimes family members who have lived in kind of parallel universes with very busy lives which work and childcare and a whole range of other arrangements. When they found themselves cocooned together, um, there was actually a discovery and an unveiling of new mental health needs that were often quite advanced in terms of depression, anxiety, eating disorder, alcohol and drug addiction, gambling issues. These became unavoidable and came out into stark reality and accessing primary care or other usual supports was interrupted at that time. So this was a very intense period and sometimes for many people it became intolerable as people were overstressed. And we've seen CSO data in relation to 
alcohol consumption for many households rose very rapidly uh, in other areas it reduced we've seen people adapting very different lifestyle approaches in terms of exercise levels and people took to the couch and have been there for the last 10 weeks others have been outdoors getting exercise and activity so different coping mechanisms have come into play some successful and some less successful but for households where there's an individual with a significant and enduring mental health need, often depending on some of the day programs that Sinead just described, either delivered through NGO partners or directly by HZ, some of these you know, had to retract very quickly as services because they had their own staffing concern, had to retreat back to residential, acute and inpatient services. But this left a major void. And for people with significant and often disabling mental health issues, you can sometimes coast and freewheel for a short while, perhaps a period of three to four weeks, before, before things start becoming really, really difficult. And there's been a number of examples and calls we've received through Mental Health Ireland of family members who are trying to remotely support a vulnerable person or couldn't uh, offer them support, or people who had established really good, healthy patterns were beginning to fall out of these patterns and were beginning to gather uh, mental health need, and it was becoming more obvious. In the whole area of rapid access and emergency access, there were certainly concerns there in terms of, and we've seen this for wider health concerns in relation to cancer and screening, but people not using the health service for fear of contracting COVID, and that was a major challenge as well. I suppose a number of agencies doing our own, we are plugged into international networks through the likes of, say, Mental Health Europe or the International Initiative for Mental Health Leaders. And we also had an opportunity to interact with colleagues in European countries, particularly in Spain and in Italy. So we got a, a, a foretaste of what was likely to happen if public health measures weren't successful. And there was an opportunity for us to communicate that right across our systems. So NGOs tend to have very good relationships with a broad range of communities, with other community structures, across government departments, with Gardaí, with sports leaders, etc. So we were in a very good position to get a, a seismic sense of what was happening there. And so I think that has been really important. I'm very conscious that many people watching this today have had perhaps had the condition and it's a very difficult condition it's not just a flu um, as some international leaders would have us believe uh, it's a very difficult condition some have had family members who've been ill some have lost family members i'm very conscious of that as well so it's been a troubling time and the things that we naturally do in terms of engaging um, have often been removed or adapted in some way this might sound a little curious, but there's been certain upsides to the experience around COVID as well. There's been an enormous upswelling of community bond, of collaboration, of volunteering, of people coming together. And people who only ever had a nodding acquaintance with neighbours are now daily conversations across the garden hedge, be it two metres apart, through WhatsApp groups as well. And that has been really, really protective. And it's important that we try and hold on to some of these benefits as we come out the far side of COVID. But we also need to be mindful too that um, as we re-enter, that might be an uneven process, that some of those bonds might become strained, there might be impatience, that people need to be just back at work and get on with it. Um, so people are at different levels of readiness, and that's been certainly seen across our sector as well. We've, um, we've seen this, I think Sinead has mentioned there as well, extraordinary rapid uptake, stuff that was science fiction three, four months ago, is not only able to happen, but has happened. And, you know, there's been great adaptation to digital uh, technologies and these really have an important role to play but we just need to be very careful that we know what our strengths are what our limitations are and when we best use them and how they can enhance face time and actual in-person contact and whether that's with a volunteer a befriender a peer worker in a recovery college or with a health professional or other parts of the, the state systems as well uh, sometimes a human contact and the digital divide is really uh, something we need to be very alert to. In our own organisation, we would have acquired over 20 Zoom licences and made these available through a whole range of different partners. We also saw very, very rapid development and some really high quality material working on the evidence as it was adapting as it goes in terms of new resources available online through social media, through websites, uh, using different fora and a whole range of everything from family conferences to international linkages uh, using Zoom or Microsoft Teams and a range of other tools there as well. So I think um, there are certain things that we should retain as we come out of this. Uh, some will naturally fall back into the landscape, so um, I think there are certain benefits there as well. We're alert that for staff members who've been working in their own home across the sectors, both in professional services and in the NGO sector as well, that's been quite intrusive. Not everyone has the space in their home. Sometimes we've uh, 
and say inadvertently been introduced to family members padding about in the background in Zoom calls, etc. But um, this has been quite an intrusion, particularly for people who've had childcare difficulties, that's been quite a challenge. And across the NGO sector, we've seen people who found that almost you know, impossible to manage that uh, in, in particular weeks where their, their childcare arrangements weren't available to them. So these were very real challenges. Uh, but I think people have been really committed and creative. But we just need to be very alert that the that level of heroic commitment is, is, it can be a recipe for burning out people. Uh, so people need to take leave, need to take breaks, need to take downtime and enough some space for reflective practice. Some of the very pragmatic things that NGO partners have encountered as well is just the simple uh, economics of this in terms of retaining services. Many services are depending on, say, charity shops or other fundraisers, and these have been interrupted. And while our outgoings might have been reduced and certain things like cost of travel, et cetera, have been reduced or use of venues, um, there are some very real economic pieces. And Agencies have had to adapt in terms of um, board meetings, in terms of AGMs have been held remotely, and even from an audit perspective, you know, we must trade uh, responsibly. And auditors sometimes have the difficulty to say, well, can, as we anticipate the future, and it's clearly recognised that there's a difficult economic period coming, um, can you actually sign off on accounts as uh, trading in, 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 in that kind of environment? So that, that's been a, a very real phenomenon. I suppose a lot of the activity happening across our community and in different agencies um, and across life generally in Ireland has been in something of a medically induced coma for the last number of weeks. And we're kind of coming out of that, but we still have some artificial life support in place. And as wage support schemes and 350 euro schemes are reduced and weaned away, we will discover that the levels of unemployment are actually going to be quite high and many sectors are going to find it very, very difficult to, to come out of this. So I think the rafting up and collaboration, which has been really important, has worked really, really well. And obviously working with mental health reform, working with the HSE in terms of our collaboration telephone calls, with the WHEEL, with the Irish Charities Institute as well, there's been really good touch points there and sharing, and people have been very generous with insights. Uh, and that's really, really been very helpful because for people in leadership roles, that's been absolutely critical. The, some of our contacts from international colleagues have suggested that the, the level of mental health need is, is quite profound. Um, there's a chap called Brian Flynn, who is a former Assistant Surgeon General in the US. And he has spent 40 years supporting people in post-disaster, and that's everything from huge weather events, terrorist events, school shootings, large tragedies. And he was describing a number of features. One was the duration of an event. So when there's been a huge tragedy, he says that when you're in the middle of that, time becomes elastic, and but you do have a sense that in two or three days' time, Sometimes literally the dust will settle and we'll get back to some degree of normality. So the duration is really important. With COVID, we don't quite know the full duration. Are we now midpoint? Are we past this? Are we 10% in? So we can't visualize the time bar. That makes it very difficult. And also whether you're a frontline volunteer, a worker, or working in the health service, your ability to retract back to a safe place is really, really important. Um, but that may be constrained somehow if your fears you're going to bring to your family members or loved ones um, any contagious effects and that's a really important feature as well but he was describing that following the hurricane katrina event that in the two years immediately after that the additional case of anxiety depression and ptsd just three mental health phenomena the cost of responding to these and this is not the human distress but the actual financial cost was the same as fixing the levees that surrounded new orleans so it was a $13 billion cost, and these are mental health conditions. But he was also making the point that we need to be very careful when to, to recognize being anxious, being afraid, being uncertain are often absolutely healthy and appropriate responses, and that communities naturally bond together and can process and respond to these things. So we need to be careful not to get in the way of this and not to interrupt the, these natural and healthy processes, but also being alert to people with very significant mental health need people who get displaced, people who lose their jobs, and people find themselves using services who had never anticipated that in their lives before. And for people with significant and enduring mental health needs who get a lot of support from services, both NGO and public services, um, are sometimes lost to service, fall off the grid, disappear, and in the urgency uh, of demands of an acute medical phenomena, sometimes their needs, which can be less sophisticated, but can be very, very close for the individual and their families and indeed their communities, uh, this can be overlooked. So I think there's been uh, an enormous mobilization across the mental health space 
uh, a number of agencies have participated in the hashtag in this together with a range of different participation programs. There's been huge goodwill. The business community has come forward. We've seen extraordinary adaptation to digital in terms of counseling and therapy services have been offered, training services with large agencies in the commercial sector, in the voluntary sector, community groups. Um, there's been a lot of innovation and we need to retain the, the better elements of that. But I suppose a lot of people in Ireland have discovered the last number of weeks has been an extraordinary change of pace. And this has created an opportunity for reflection and sometimes some existential questions like a number of groups have done deep dives in terms of their own strategies, their objectives, their priorities, business continuity planning, which is one of those things that you, you might put off for a rainy day. Um, in our organization, we had just completed a very comprehensive business continuity plan, which interestingly didn't mention pandemics at all. So uh, we felt to add a new chapter there. So I think one of the things that has been very impressive though, that Irish people recognize that we can face huge onslaughts and enormous challenges when we work together. And I think certainly when we look at some of the international experience with our near neighbors and our neighbors on the other side of the pond, um, you can see the importance of leadership, clear messaging, cohesion, and working together. And that's probably easier when you're moving into a closed down scenario. And we've seen a little bit of fraying at the edges of that in terms of discordant voice about whether one meter is sufficient over two. Um, I think as NGO uh, providers and partners, we have to be very active in that process. We work with people who are often at the margins, sometimes find it difficult to connect. Uh, people who might be from difficult to reach communities, perhaps migrant communities, people whose language might be uh, an issue in terms of the traveling community, prison populations, etc. We have to make sure that all voices are heard and everyone steps forward together and, and we can collaborate in that way. So I think, again, to recognize there's been you know, a great disposing of boundaries in lots of ways. So people in the formal services, in the public sector and in the NGO sector have collaborated and worked very, very closely together. And that bond has been really well formed. Um, if we can retain that esprit de corps, which has been essential over the last number of weeks, I think it's really important. But we will obviously have to recognize the very stark economic picture that's probably coming our way um, and prepare ourselves and streamline for that because we must be sustainable and the service we offer are, are key and critical. So it's important that they're, they're protected. So I'll, uh, I'm conscious that there's lots of questions appearing in, in the chat line here. So I think it's probably a good time to, to move into that space and, and have an interactive discussion. Thanks, Martin. And so great to have Mental Health Ireland's perspective on that. And certainly it would mirror some of the stuff we're hearing from our, um, our members in Mental Health Reform as well. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time for questions. We're already over time, but what we might do is we might try to get some answers offline and circulate them to people because there were a high number of questions. Um, so we might chat about that after. Um, but thank you everyone for bearing with us and thank you so much to um, our speakers for their contribution and sharing their experience. Um, I think you can all agree that we learned a lot about how COVID-19 has impacted Ireland and what we need to be considering going forward. Um, so, so thank you very much everyone for joining us. Um, I'm going to just share a link in the chat now for a survey for the webinar because this is a new initiative so we would very much welcome your feedback on this. Um, and the other thing is that next week um, we will be joined by Ulster University um, and the Samaritans as we look at some kind of on the ground experience um, and they've done some research together into the change in the nature and the number of the calls that Samaritans have received pre-COVID-19 and during COVID-19. So that should be really, um, that should be really, really interesting. And we'll be sending information out about that either today or tomorrow. Um, so once again, thank you so much to our speakers and thank you so much to all the attendees um, for, for staying with us. Um, and I'm really sorry we didn't get to Q&A, but I think we had a great discussion about the topic. Um, so, so thank you everyone for joining us and we might end the webinar there if that's okay. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Yeah.